Welcome to a special edition of the NWI.com Political Roundtable for Wednesday, November 20th. I'm Robert Blaskowitz, Assistant Managing Editor of The Times. Joining with me today, Doug Ross, Editorial Page Editor of The Times, and our two special guests, uh, members of the State Board of Education, uh, Gordon Hendry, an at-large member from Indianapolis, and Tony Walker from right here in the 1st Congressional District, both Democrats, uh, here to talk about uh, kind of the n real interesting uh, goings-on right now. Uh, with the State Board of Education and uh, and the superintendent and uh, if you want to talk about what you're doing here in this area kind of a listening tour and what what you're hearing sure well thanks for having us and uh, very pleased to be here in Northwest Indiana um, we're uh, I am embarking as the newest board member on a listening tour of the state and visiting each congressional district to meet with um, first of all the district uh, board member and then uh, also meeting with um, uh, and touring schools, meeting with parents, teachers, students, and administrators. And really the purpose of that is um, because I'm not an educator by training, I've, my background is in business and economic development, um, uh, I really want to learn more about the state of education here in Indiana. Uh, and obviously we want to do as a board everything we can to make uh, you know Indiana the best uh, state for education in the United States. And I'm just on the tour to staff and support board. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. So what kind of feedback have you heard from, from uh, educators and from others in the, in the public? Well, so we've been to uh, one school today and we're going uh, here in, uh, in Hammond and uh, we're going to Michigan City later this afternoon mm -hmm. and um, we visited uh, the Hask, uh, Hask School and um, their focus is on science and technology and um, I think we were both very impressed with uh, the administration, with the teachers, with the parents, and most importantly the students. Mm -hmm. um, these are uh, young kids who are uh, very passionate about learning mm -hmm. um, and uh, they uh, it was clear that uh, the school is uh, innovating and breaking new ground and um, preparing these students for the workplace and for uh, their careers. Well there's a lot happening at the State Board of Education um, and you know the kind of part of the controversy is kind of a parallel board uh, set up by uh, Governor Pence, Governor Mike Pence, I should say, the uh, uh, Center for Education, Center for Excellence and in Education and Innovation, or innovation. something like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the Center for Confusing Acronyms is <laughs> named it. And uh, so, you know, the, the question is, what the heck do you need this agency for if you, we've already got the State Board of Education and the Department of Education as Superintendent of Public Instruction? Um, you know, what's your take well, on that? Well, Doug, it's not a parallel agency at all. Quite frankly, the governor, even prior to becoming governor, has been very clear about wanting to clear out the pathways between schools and graduation and a job. So this center is really coming out of uh, his desire to smooth the pathway so kids that graduate with the understanding that most of them are not going to college. That is just a fact in this state. So they do need to be able to have jobs and we need to make it easier for them to make that transition. That is the primary goal of the center. Now, it is in no way a shadow organization of the Department of Education. It doesn't take away any authority or power from the Department of Education. What it does, uh, in addition to the innovation piece, uh, the work school to work uh, innovation piece is to support through staffing needs the State Board of Education. Now that's never been the job of the Department of Education quite frankly. Uh, as a matter of fact if you go back to the old uh, Tony Bennett days of the State Board, the State Board really didn't have any independent advisors or staff to take a double look at what was going on at the department. The State Board is the one that is tasked with the authority to set education policy in the state. And there is no limit on who we can talk to, who we can solicit help from to work through those issues. Now one agency that is there to implement decisions made by the State Board is the Department of Education. That does not mean that that is the only agency that the State Board can turn to to do analyze data and to help us make the decisions we need to make. And the members of the State Board now also feel very strongly, as Governor Pence does, in making sure we're doing things that land students in jobs and land them and make them as competitive as possible in getting into college. So the CECI 
is very useful to us in terms of helping us crunch data with those goals in mind so we're making policy decisions that support that outcome. I but it's not add, a duplicate. I would just add to that that uh, CECI is is really a resource for the board. It's not, um, as Tony mentioned, it's not intended to take authority or um, take a role uh, away from the board of Edu uh, from the uh, Department of Education. It's really a resource for the State Board of Education uh, so they we can better do our jobs and I think that's important. In addition, I would say CECI, the primary focus isn't on the State Board of Education. Um, only, uh, only a couple of its uh, staff are, are dedicated to uh, the State Board and the rest of the staff are working on other important issues like workforce development. So um, I, I, I think Unfortunately, um, in my short time on the board, less than two months, it does seem that uh, there has been some politics interjected and, and really I think from uh, Tony and my perspective and the rest of the board members is we want to get beyond that. We want to focus on what's important for the kids. Uh, we want to focus on making Indiana schools the best they can be and um, education is not a political issue. It's not a Democrat or Republican issue. It is a um, it is an issue about uh, it's it's bipartisan, and we have a bipartisan board, and we want to work as a board with the superintendent um, and find common ground and further uh, Indiana's educational uh, future. So, um, you know, we want to be collaborative. I know that there's been a lot of a lot of back and forth down in Indianapolis, and. I think we all want to hit the reset button and get beyond that, mm -hmm. focus on what's really important. Well, we, you know, we've seen uh, the battle between uh, Governor Pence and, and Superintendent of uh, Public Construction, Glenda Ritz. So, uh, you, you know, short of a, a beer summit, uh, Obama style, how, how would you uh, get the two of them working back together again? Well, Doug, I, I challenge the way you phrase it a little bit because we haven't seen any battle from Governor Pence to Superintendent Ritz, quite frankly. We've seen the superintendent trying to draw the governor's office into conflict, but the governor has been very clear that, hey, the state board is the state board. Now, you're a part of that board. These are the people you work with. I'm really not in it. And quite frankly, he's not in it. And uh, I think the quicker the superintendent takes that posture and starts working with her colleagues, you know, maybe we can start moving forward. Well, what about what we've heard on our end, which is that the governor has basically shut the, the superintendent out of some of the discussions involved in the creation of, for example, the CECI. Um, and, and, and that he really isn't consulting with her on these big, larger educational issues. What and, about that? And, and that's part of the misconception is that the superintendent of public instruction is a policy setting position. Mm -hmm. It is not. Mm -hmm. I mean, the superintendent of public instruction is largely an administrative position. It's an executive department, which the governor is the head of the executive mm -hmm. branch. It's an executive department tasked with basically implementing the policies as established by the State Board of Education. There mm -hmm. is no special uh, requirement for the governor to uh, basically single out the superintendent from the rest of the State Board mm -hmm. to have discussions about policy directions. And then beyond that, the governor can solely control what he wants to accomplish as governor mm -hmm. because these issues extend beyond what we do from K-12 to education. It includes the colleges and uh, the universities in the state, workforce development. So to think that the governor, in order to govern the state, has to consult with the superintendent mm -hmm. of public instruction is not true in the first place. And I think everyone needs to get, um, everyone needs to take a look at the roles mm -hmm. and responsibilities under Indiana right. law. Um, and, you know, understanding, as Tony mentioned, that um, the governor and the state legislature enact the laws. Uh, the state uh, superintendent of uh, public instruction uh, implements policy that is set by the state board of education. The state board of education sets policy. That's our role, and she implements it under our under our watch. So, I think um, I, I think that the role is not education czar for the state of Indiana, mm -hmm. I think everyone should go back and take a refresher course and uh, really understand what the role of the superintendent of public instruction is in the state of Indiana. Well, in light of the powers in that role, should the superintendent of public instruction be an elected position? Because an elected position would dictate that it would be someone that has some powers that 
that would be responsive to the citizens? Should it be an appointed position? By the I, governor? I think that's a conversation that's worth having. Uh, however, I do not believe that is a conversation worth having as to a specific individual. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, here in Indiana, we're, we should be about good government and we should be thinking about what works um, and what's best for the state of Indiana. And it shouldn't be about, um, you know, minimizing one individual's uh, responsibility, but it should be about what, what makes the most right. sense for us. And I would say also, um, from a, uh, a Democratic and Republican standpoint, it seems to me that this may be even a, a point of uh, bipartisan agreement because um, back in 2004, uh, it was actually uh, in the state Democratic Party's um, uh, platform that the uh, public instruction, the superintendent of public instruction would be an appointed position. And actually, our candidate ran on that very issue. Mm -hmm. So as did, uh, as did uh, Mitch Daniels, who ultimately won. So uh, I think that uh, it's something that has been discussed mm -hmm. in the past, whether to make it appointed or not. I think what's most important, though, whether it's uh, appointed or elected, is mm -hmm. we've got to take uh, politics out of it. I don't care who got more votes uh, or you know who's an elected yeah. official. Part, uh, politics should not be part of the discussion. It should be focused on the kids and the school and the state of education. Uh, I guess if you're going to you know talk about you know making this position uh, an appointed position, you probably ought to broaden the conversation and include the treasurer, for example. Um, you know, and some of those other positions that, you know, frankly, are administrative, exactly, right. you know, and, uh, of course, county government, we've been talking about that all along, uh, that, you know, they're, you know, auditor, recorder, you know, why do you even clerk, why do you elect these positions? So, you know, perhaps it's time to join that conversation and talk about it at the state level as well. Um, one of the uh, issues that has really become a, kind of a a hot button issue in the state of education is Common Core, uh, with kind of an interesting uh, groups uh, lining up in opposition to Common Core. You have uh, conservatives who uh, see this as kind of the intrusion of the federal government. You have others that that see this as, as kind of uh, uh, removing uh, kind of the creativity from teachers in the state. Uh, but then you have others saying. You know that that Indiana needs to kind of get on board with something that the rest of the country is doing, uh, in terms of this baseline of uh, instruction uh, that our students can can compete with uh, the rest of the students in the country. On what are, what are your views of the Common Core and, and the whole debate? Well, as you know, I've I've been a long time supporter of Common Core, and I still support Common Core. Mm -hmm. uh, when you focus the kind of laser attention on any state standards that people have now done with Common Core, you can always find a book or something in the standards that you're like, oh wow, this is there. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is right now Indiana standards are Common Core standards. Mm -hmm. That has already been adopted. And I don't think that we can really go in reverse from where we are. Schools across the state have already at various degrees started implementing Common Core. Mm -hmm. We recently had the um, college board coming out saying they are redesigning the SAT mm -hmm. to be compliant or, or to uh, reflect Common Core standards. We cannot be an island here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the arguments I get, and we get a lot of emails and letters regarding this, most of those arguments tend to go around states' rights and the idea that folks in Indiana just don't like everyone else doing mm -hmm. what the federal government is doing. But, mm -hmm. you know, I hasten to add that um, Common Core essentially came out of the National Governors Association with mm -hmm. the support of Mitch Daniels, a Republican-dominated National Governors mm -hmm. Association, by the way. Uh, and it just so happened that Arne Duncan and President Obama signed on to that later, but it started as a Republican initiative. But somehow it's got politicized in a sort of anti-Obama way, where all of a sudden, when we initially passed Common Core, there wasn't even a big hoopla. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Uh, <laughs> there were a few people out on the fringes, mm -hmm. but nothing like right. it took on once it became associated somehow with the Obama administration. But the fact of the matter is, businesses across this country have been clear 
that they want a apples to apples, oranges to oranges comparison mm -hmm. on education systems in the country. And we will hurt ourselves, in my opinion, if we try to opt out of that system. Because you know what? It's not going to be seen as, though. well, Indiana just decided they're going to have better standards. Yeah. It's going to be seen as Indiana didn't want to be as rigorous as Common Core. And, and we can't afford that. And quite frankly, our overall state student performance outcomes don't really justify going on our own right now, to be honest with you. I believe that Indiana should have a set of standards that prepare our students to be career and college ready. Um, and uh, those should be nationally aligned. Um, you know, we've already implemented Common Core and uh, many classrooms are using textbooks that are uh, right. aligned with Common Core. My, my wife's a teacher involved in textbook adoption and mm -hmm. they have the Common Core textbooks. So. So I don't know that it uh, makes sense to uh, roll it back in Indiana. Uh, Tony made a, a good point that uh, this was developed by the National Governors Association in a bipartisan manner um, and was implemented by Indiana. So, um, you know, generally I think that, uh, you know, there are, there are ways that uh, it may be tweaked uh, to uh, here in the state of Indiana, but um, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to roll it back. Well, one of the things uh, we've talked about is probably uh, uh, school accountability. We've talked about, you know, the A to F grading school uh, scale and so forth. But, you know, the question is, you know, we saw the, the under uh, Tony Bennett, we saw the um, um, Roosevelt, for instance, got taken over in Gary uh, and put under state control. Uh, several high schools in Indianapolis, or several schools, mm -hmm. I should say, in Indianapolis, the same thing. You know, are we going to be seeing another wave of this uh, for the next few years, or you know, what should we be looking for? Well, well, the failing schools have to be addressed. It, it's not fair to children that are trapped in neighborhoods where their parents don't have the economic means to pick up and leave to just say those schools are failing and we don't care about them. We did that for a very long time in this state, and I, I just want to say that. Roosevelt is, you know, often gets sort of thrown in with the whole A to F accountability uh, issue, but Roosevelt was not taken over under A to F. Right. It was taken mm -hmm. over under Public Law 221 after six years mm -hmm. of not performing adequately. Um, and we also have the uh, AYP system that was out there by the federal government. We implemented A to F because there was no debate among schools, teachers, parents, that AYP was very damaging to schools in Indiana. You had schools like Holbert High School that under the state system were an a school, uh, was an A school, but because of AYP was capped at a C. So we worked with the federal government to come up with an accountability system that they had to approve in order for us to get from under AYP. That system didn't, was not perfect. Matter of fact, the majority of us had things in it, you know, a laundry list of things we didn't like about it, including Tony Bennett, by the way. But many of those metrics were forced upon us by the federal government. And now we're sort of talking about it as if, you know, well, what were they doing? Well, actually, uh, we were doing what the Fed said we had to do to, in order to uh, throw out AYP. Now, clearly, no accountability system is going to be perfect. It needs some work. We're doing that work now, but at the end of the day, Indiana is now nationally recognized as having the strongest system of accountability in the country. That's going to be very important going forward, and it's a commitment by the previous governor and I think this governor to say that no child truly is going to be left behind. And let me say, too, um, school accountability really was developed under Governor Frank O'Bannon, a uh, Democrat, mm -hmm. and continued on. Um, you know, since that time. So it's something that's been a bipartisan issue. And, you know, we, we believe, I believe strongly in accountability. I think mm -hmm. if you can't measure uh, success, um, then uh, you, you, you don't know where you stand. So um, that there's a big problem with that. Um, so, and I, and I would also add that um, I just recently visited one of the takeover schools in Indianapolis, um, the Amadonna School. And uh, I gotta say that uh, what they've done there in just a short period of time has uh, just been tremendous. Uh, the school safety, you know, you don't think about that, but mm -hmm. you know, the kids are uh, well behaved, they're safe uh, in, a, in a safe learning environment. Uh, 
but then uh, just the school itself, you just by its uh, test scores and everything else. Mm -hmm. The performance over the past couple of years has been very strong, and I think it's likely to continue to improve. So. I think uh, to call it a takeover, I think is maybe a little bit of a misnomer. But um, you know, if I had a, I have a child right now who's a kindergartner in Indianapolis Public Schools, she's in a great school. But if she wasn't, uh, and I would not want her to be for six years in a failing school with no accountability. I would want change. And I think there's a lot of parents out there, uh, you know, of kids where you know maybe they can't move to the the uh, district where the schools are better you know for whatever reason and it's not fair to them to um, you know uh, have their students in a failing school mm -hmm. for six seven eight years uh, because that's just uh, that's that's not the way we want to do business in our educational system mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important for your viewers to know too that the the school accountability system is not all you need to know about a school. You, you can't, it, it's almost negligent to just look at the letter grade and make a determination about the school based upon the accountability grade because we're only looking at a set number of factors and, and, and not enough factors for my liking. For instance, with the you know elementary schools, uh, middle schools, we're really just looking at standardized test scores and a school is much more mm -hmm. than that. And, for instance, we were at Hast this morning, Hammond Academy of Science and Technology. That's a phenomenal school. Now, the school, in their accountability grade, received a failing grade. Not because it's a bad school, because it was a bad rubric by which it was mm -hmm. judged. And the school didn't have, because they started out adding grades, they were being penalized for data that they didn't have because they didn't have 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. That's something that we've now corrected, but there could always be those types of issues, and we're starting now to deal with the schools to have unique configurations on an individual basis and trying to address some of those problems. But I would just uh, really tell parents, you go, <coughs> go beyond the school letter grade. That is not the end-all, be-all about the success of your school. The school letter grade does not measure, as we saw at HAST, does not measure uh, parent involvement, which is critical to the su success of schools and, yeah. and students. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different metrics right. and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, par parental involvement is one key one that isn't captured yeah. by the uh, current system. Well, before we wrap up, uh, are there uh, issues that you would like to see the board and, and the State Board of Education uh, tackle uh, going forward here? Yeah, well, I, I want to say I, I look forward to getting back to the real meat of what we're supposed to be doing and getting past the politics of it. Because, number one, I think the most important thing on the legislative agenda when the Assembly uh, reconvenes in January is going to be lowering the age of mandatory school attendance to five. Uh, that, that is apparently going to be on the table, and I hope right. it gets there is bipartisan no mandatory report. Right now, you don't have to go until you're seven. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and we need to have it at five because every five-year-old should be in a full-time kindergarten. I mean, the data just supports that. A lot of the outcomes later in life depend upon the early childhood piece. So I'd like to see that. I'd like to see project-based learning uh, model really proliferate throughout the state. HAST is a good uh, a model for that. New tech here in uh, Calumet Township. Uh, you know, we have more and more classrooms that are adopting technology and doing blended learning, giving iPads. That's the wave of the future. That's how the kids are learning to mm -hmm. collaborate and work on issues. So we should be supportive of that as a board. And the sooner we can get back to making policies that address future needs and not fighting over silly stuff, the better. You know, um, as the newest board member, I'm really out uh, just uh, visiting different parts of the state and, and trying to learn um, what uh, the state of education looks like and, you know, hopefully we'll bring some of the lessons that I've learned uh, back to the state board. And, you know, I'm just hopeful in the short term. Obviously, there's been a lot of controversy and back and forth in Indianapolis uh, involving the state board of education, and my hope is that uh, we can get beyond that. We can get back to focusing on issues that matter. Uh, and, you know, I'm hopeful that um, the State Board of Education can work with the Superintendent of Public Instruction uh, to find common ground. I know for myself, I've reached out and have a one-on-one -on -one with the Superintendent next week. I'm looking forward to uh, having a conversation with her and, and hopefully we can find some common ground and, and move forward the way everyone out there wants us yeah. to.
Well, we hope that's successful. And uh, we thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us, Gordon Hendry, uh, Tony Walker, State Board of Education members. And thank you for watching this edition of the Political Roundtable.